we will start with the first lecture of week number 8 and in this uh, lecture we are going to first look at the functions of an air conditioning system then we will look at the classification of air conditioning system according to application and there are three types of central air conditionings that we will look at and finally we will focus on one of those types which is the type that is most widely used and we will go into greater details of that ty type of a system so when we look at an uh, air conditioning system it uh, performs a certain functions the primary function of course is to provide the necessary energy for cooling or heating of the conditioned space but other than that we also need to ensure that the air is proper, uh, properly humidified or dehumidified it has to be cleaned and purified that means if there are any airborne particles or contaminants in the air they have to be removed before it is uh, supplied to the conditioned space and even the noise levels which result uh, due to the operation of the air conditioning equipment has to be monitored according to our requirement for example if you are working on a shop floor which is air conditioned noise levels are, which are higher are permissible but if you are going to provide air conditioning for a library or an office environment definitely the noise levels over there will be comparatively much lower and that also has to be uh, taken care of when you design your air conditioning system then we need to distribute the conditioned air that means in the right quantity or volume flow rate it has to be supplied to the conditioned spaces and within the conditioned spaces we must also ensure that the air distribution is proper that means that the air movement inside the conditioned space is also proper then of course we need to uh, control the environmental parameters within the predetermined limits uh, we can allow the temperature or relative humidity to vary but we will set those values that within those values the temperature or relative humidity can vary if it goes above or below that then there must be a control mechanism for that the classification of an air conditioning system uh, we can do it in t uh, on the basis of application that is for human comfort and that takes various forms for example if you are providing uh, air conditioning to the occupants of an office building or a shopping center or a restaurant that's the commercial sector uh, you, you also provide uh, the same air conditioning for educational institutes libraries etc so you have the institutional sector after that we can also go to the residential se sector that includes hotels or apartment blocks that are air conditioned and then we or have hospitals clinics or other hair health uh, uh, care facilities and finally of course the transport uh, uh, modes that include both air tra travel travel on roads on sea so we have uh, a wide and diverse applications of air conditioning for human comfort then we move on to the industrial application that is process air conditioning and there are several examples I have just uh, identified a few over here for example in the textile industry uh, when we uh, manufacture of particular textile or a fabric the fiber that is used for manufacturing has its properties very much dependent on the humidity and the temperature levels and those are controlled by using some sort of an air conditioning system then we have various applications of air conditioning in the manufacturing industry uh, one very important example is in the manufacture of integrated circuits and computer chips which require an exceptionally clean environment and a very precise control of the temperature and humidity levels within that en environment the same applies to 
production of precision instruments and products where again even the noise levels which can lead to vibration are to be kept within very strictly controlled limits a very important application is in the pharmaceutical industry which has a very stringent uh, uh, standards to maintain the quality of your product that is a medicine or a drug and so at every st step of the production those standards have to be maintained because if we allow let's say one of the variables for example the temperature to exceed a certain value during a certain process that can lead to a particular chemical reaction not proceeding properly and that will ultimately lead to a medicine or a drug that will ultimately harm the person who takes that drug so these uh, these processes in a pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical industry have very strict controls we now move on to central air conditioning systems and there are three broad categories that is all air systems when we talk about these three categories uh, we divide uh, or distinguish between them according to the mode of the energy transfer that is how we are carrying energy from the condition conditioned space if it is done solely through the use of air within the conditioned space that is known as an all air system and that all air system that will be we will look at later on requires the use of air handling units or rooftop packages through which the air is conditioned how they these uh, function you will uh, look at it later the difference between an air handling unit and a rooftop package uh, is that primarily in a rooftop package the refrigeration system is also present over there whereas in, a, in an air handling unit the refrigeration system is separate and it is located in the plant room of the system then uh, we look at the various advantages and disadvantages of such a system and for large uh, buildings and a complex uh, complexes this has the greatest uh, greatest potential for energy conservation and we have very precise temperature and uh, humidity control air distribution and ventilations under varying loads is uh, carried out uh, quite well with this and the noise in the conditioned space is minimized because we have a plant which is located away from the conditioned spaces as required of course the it has a certain you can call it disadvantages that they take up more space and uh, if you have to retrofit uh, such a system that means after several years you have to make changes that may not be always possible and uh, the balancing of air requires in large buildings special attention but that is uh, nowadays not that critical uh, prob uh, um, much of a problem because we do it through uh, computerized control systems then we have the second type of air conditioning system which is known as air and water system and this time we are using both air and water inside the conditioned space for the energy transfer the water takes away the sensible energy if we are talking about cooling it will uh, be chilled water that is used in the conditioned space if you want to provide heating then it will be hot water and the air will take up the role of ventilation and it will also carry away the latent load that is the moisture from the conditioned space and they, they, these are systems which uh, work best for what is known as perimeter applications that means in the exterior spaces of buildings with large sensible loads and where the control of humidity and is uh, not required uh, very uh, uh, closely the advantage of course is that you can control individual zones by varying the uh, both the air and water flow rates or temperatures
space requirement is somewhat reduced and the cooling coil is in the conditioned space but it is dry so the problem that you will have a condens condensate that will have to be drained away is not present and that also eliminates any risks of bacterial growth okay the disadvantage is that operation control is quite difficult in the sense that we need to control both the flow rate of water and air and their te temperatures and as i mentioned earlier they have uh, the usage uh, is suitable for perimeter zones where we have uh, large sensible loads then we will move on to the third type in which we will use only water for carrying the energy into or away from the conditioned space and they again require units which are known as fan coil units and they are located in each room of the building and if cooling is required chilled water will be circulated inside those FCUs and if it is uh, heating that is required you can circulate hot water through those coils and uh, that uh, is how the all water system works the air has uh, no role in that sense that if we require ventilation the air will have to be supplied from outside through an opening in the wall and these would work where you will just require individual room control and again they require less space and they can be easily retrofitted uh, individual room control is possible and because the in winter the temperature of the water that is required is not too much we can also use make use of solar or waste heat for that purpose and simultaneous heating and cooling is possible with what is known as a four pipe system system that means there will be two coils one which which can carry hot water and other which can carry cold water whereas there uh, is also known as uh, another system which is a two pipe system so at one time you can either provide co co chilled water or hot water the disadvantage is that ma maintenance uh, costs are higher and uh, draining of the condensate uh, can be a uh, issue at times and that can lead to health risks because uh, bacterial gr growth can occur if the condensate water is not properly drained from the conditioned space uh, ventilation can be a uh, issue with these because we are just relying on the outside air and especially when we talk about summer and humid climates then it uh, is may not be suitable to use these sorts of uh, systems the most widely used system is the all air system and that is the type of system that we are now going to look at and we will go into more details of the all air central air conditioning system uh, these are systems for large area buildings with many zones of conditioned space that means when we say a zone <coughs> a zone may is not necessarily a single room it can be a collection of several rooms but they all have the same operating characteristics and then you can have large area buildings where we have several zones which have their own operating characteristics and for that we can use central air conditioning system of an all air type and the all air system will have subsystems one of which is the air system remember we are using air as the only medium which is used to condition the space and the components of a uh, air system include the air handling units the duct work for supplying the air and returning the air from the conditioned space or spaces and there are various terminals or VAV units VAV stands for variable air volume we will uh, look at uh, uh, that as well later on and of course when the air is supplied to a room or a space we have to diffuse it so the air movement in the conditioned space is also done in a proper manner and then we also need a exhaust system for maintaining the desired indoor air quality we exhaust part of the air from the conditions uh, returning from the conditioned space and then 
mix the recirculated air with the fresh outside air. We will also need in this uh, type of a system water and that water is supplied to what is known as the air handling unit and the water that we use in the air handling unit can be either chilled water or hot water depending on what our requirement in winter we will be using hot water to heat the air that passes over the heating coil in an air handling unit whereas in summer we will be supplying chilled water to the cooling coil for cooling the air that passes over that coil and subsequently goes into the conditioned space. As I said earlier we have a central plant which is separately located maybe in the basement of a building or it could be a even separate facility away from the building as well and that is done to ensure that the noise of the equipment in the plant is not transmitted into the conditioned spaces we have access for the personnel working in the plant for uh, maintenance purposes etc and the central plant will house the refrigeration plant which is also known as a chiller package you will have uh, that will ultimately provide you with the chilled water you will have the boiler plant that will provide you uh, uh, with the hot water or maybe even steam for uh, winter air conditioning and we will have pumps for the water for circulating the water and also we might have a water cooled condenser for which there will also be a water circuit for that and finally these are now large systems and they require control through a control system we have uh, controls which are now uh, microprocessor based and we have various sensors which can be te uh, temperature gauges can be humidity, humidity measuring uh, uh, sensors pressure gauges and we have a central control system outputs from these uh, gauges and sensors allow the operation of various components of the system for example if you want to increase the flow rate you will actuate a damper or if you want to increase the flow rate of a of a, of a water we will have to open valves and that can be done through control systems uh, this is a schematic diagram of a central air conditioning system which is an all air system and we have the central plant so you will have the central plant which will house the chiller that is the entire refrigeration unit you will have the boilers you will have the pumps and if you have a water cooled condenser you can see the circuit for the cooling water that goes to the cooling tower is also shown over here then you have the air handling unit and from the air handling unit the conditioned air goes through the supply ducts into the conditioned space where it will be distributed through diffusers and then the air from the room will be returned back through return inlets back to the air handling unit what we can do is look at what is happening in the plant room and then we will move on to the air handling unit so in the plant room if you are talking about summer air conditioning we will be sending chilled water to the cooling coil of the air handling units so the evaporator serves to chill the water which is pumped to the cooling coil and what we will have is that air will pass over this cooling coil and it will cool down give up give up its heat energy to the water whose temperature will increase and that water will return to the evaporator to be again cooled and then return back to the cooling coil so that is the loop that we are looking at over here if you follow the movement of the cursor that is what is happening over here and in the air handling unit you have the air the supply air we will start from the supply side then you will see 
we will come back to the air handling unit it goes into the condition space and then it will take up the load from the condition space it will be returned and when the air is returned part of it is exhausted so we have the exhaust air over here and then the remaining part is passed through a damper the damper controls the volume flow rate of the air that is exhausted and then the volume flow that will be allowed to go through into the downstream side and we will then bring in outside air to mix with the recirculated air and that will give you the desired indoor air quality and that air will then pass over the cooling coil and there's a fan to ensure the air movement through the entire system that fan will then supply that air to the condition space so that is how it will work if you are talking about winter air conditioning then instead of the chilled water loop we will have the hot water loop in operation we have a boiler over here the hot water goes to the heating coil if required we can also provide humidification by a humidifier and the hot water will when the air passes over it the hot water will give up its heat to the air which will warm up and th the water will then return to the boiler so the heated air will then if required be humidified then it will be supplied to the conditioned space and again as before it will be returned to the AHU part of which of that air will be exhausted the remaining will be mixed with the outside air so this is the basic working of a central air conditioning plant of course in large buildings it's not necessary that you have just a, a single AHU you can have multiple AHUs which are all connected to a single plant for that central air conditioning system we will now look at the another view of the AHU and you can see all those panels like uh, it's like a large cabinet with access panels that allow you to uh, service various parts uh, of the AHU so you have dampers you will have blowers you will have uh, filters and the heating cooling coils so that is how an air handling unit would look like and I will show you an actual photograph of an air handling unit and then we will also look at a video showing the use of AHUs for in a central air conditioning system so I will just show you a photograph of, of an AHU this is from the company uh, known as Daikin so it's one of their models of the AHU you can see it's like a cabinet with the access panels open and if we start from over here this is the supply air that will go to the conditioned space and you have the return air so we start from over here the return air will come in there is going to be a set of filters over here so if any dust particles that have uh, from the conditioned space they have uh, gone into the air they will be removed we will have a fan for the uh, return air return air fan and you will have the heating and cooling coils over here so of course uh, let's first look at the return air then we will come to those coils when we talk about the supply side so when the then the return air goes into what is known as the mixing box where the exhaust uh, recirculated air mixes with the fresh air from outside so as you can see we are moving uh, with the if you look, uh, keep an eye on the cursor we are moving in this direction and we have an exhaust damper over here so part of the air which is returned from the conditioned space is exhausted the remaining air is over here and we have the fresh air again there is a damper for fresh air that is over here and there is again a filter after this damper on the lower side so that any fresh air from outside if it has dust particles etc those are removed then it goes into a energy recovery unit or a heat recovery unit which is not necessary that it is present in all AHUs uh, it may be uh, uh, required if the customer or the client wants it or we can 
ask the manufacturer not to include it in the in the AHU. You will look at the function of a heat recovery wheel or heat recovery heat exchanger in the video. So the air that comes in from the from outside is mixed with the recirculated air in the mixing box, and then that air passes through the coils. You can have a heating coil or a cooling coil. You can have more than uh, one coil depending on the requirement of the air which is sent to the conditioned space. And that air, if it's a cooling coil, will be cooled. And this is the supply fan which will send it to the conditioned space. We will now look at a video on the working of an air handling unit. So where do we find air handling units? Air handling units, which usually have the acronym of AHU, are found in medium to large commercial and industrial buildings. They are usually located in the basement, on the roof, or on the floors of a building, and many large buildings will likely have a mixture of all of these. AHUs will serve a specified area or zone within a building such as the east side or office areas from floors 1 to 10 or perhaps a single purpose such as just the building's toilets. Therefore, it's very common to find multiple AHUs around a building. Some buildings, particularly old high-rise buildings, will have just one large AHU which is usually located on the roof. These will supply the entire building. They might not have a return duct, some older designs rely on the air just simply leaking out of the building. But this design is not so common anymore in new buildings because it's very inefficient. Now it's most common to have multiple smaller AHUs supplying different zones to give better control and higher quality space conditioning. Buildings are now also much more airtight so we need to have a return duct to regulate the pressure inside the building. So what is the purpose of an air handling unit? Air handling units condition and distribute air within a building. They take fresh ambient air from outside, they then clean this, heat it or cool it, maybe humidify or dehumidify it, and then they'll force it through some ductwork around to the designated areas within the building. Most units will have an additional duct run to then pull this dirty used air out from the rooms back to the AHU where a fan will discharge this back into the atmosphere. Some of this return air might be recirculated back into the fresh air supply to save energy. We'll have a look at that later in this video. Otherwise, where that isn't possible, thermal energy can be extracted and fed into the fresh air supply intake to also save energy. Again, we'll look at that in much more detail later in this video. Let's have a look at a simple, typical AHU design and then we'll look at some more advanced ones. In this very basic model, we have two AHU housings for flow and return air. At the very front on the inlet and the outlet of each housing we have a grill to prevent objects and wildlife from entering into the mechanical components inside the AHU. Here's a photo of an AHU intake that would have sucked in a whole bunch of trash if the grill wasn't there so that's why it's important to have this installed. At the inlet of the fresh air housing and the discharge of the return air housing we have some dampers. The dampers are multiple sheets of metal which can rotate. They can close to prevent air from entering or exiting the AHU. They can open fully to fully allow air in or out and they can also vary their position somewhere in between to restrict the amount of air which can enter or exit. I'll also show you some examples here of real world dampers in AHUs. The one on the left has the motorized controller visible which changes the position of the dampers. After the dampers we'll have some filters. These are there to try and catch all the dirt and the dust etc from entering the AHU and also the building. If we don't have these filters, the dust is going to build up inside the ductwork and within the mechanical equipment. It's also going to enter the building and be breathed in by the occupants as well as make the building dirty. So we want to remove as much of this as possible. Across each of the filter banks will have a pressure sensor. This will measure how dirty the filters are and warn the engineers when it's time to replace the filters. As the filters pick up dirt, the amount of air that can flow through them is restricted and this causes a pressure drop. Typically, we'll have some panel filters or pre-filters to catch the largest dust particles. Then we'll have some bag filters to catch the smaller dust particles. We've actually covered AHU filters in great detail previously, links in the video description below, do check that video out. The next thing we'll find are the cooling and heating coils. These are there to cool or heat the air. The air temperature of the supply air is measured as it leaves the AHU. This needs to be at a design temperature to keep the people inside the building comfortable. This design temperature is called the set point. 
If the air temperature is below this value, the heating coil will add heat to increase the air temperature and bring it up to set point. If the air is too hot, then the cooling coil will remove heat to lower the air temperature and also reach the set point. The coils are heat exchangers. Inside the coil is a hot or cold fluid, usually something like a heated or chilled water, refrigerant or perhaps steam. Now we've discussed these in great detail previously in other videos. Do check those videos out, links are in the video description below. Next we'll have a fan. This is going to pull air in from outside and then through the dampers, the filters, the coils and then push this out through the ductwork and around the building. Centrifugal fans are very common in old and existing AHUs, but EC fans are now being installed and also retrofitted for increased energy efficiency. Across the fan we'll also have a pressure sensor. This will sense if the fan is running. If it is running, then it will create a pressure difference. And we can use this to detect a failure in the equipment and warn the engineers of a problem. We'll also likely have a duct pressure sensor shortly after the fan. This will read the static pressure and in some AHUs, the speed of the fan is controlled as a result of the pressure in the duct. So we'll also very often find a variable speed drive connected to the fan for variable volume systems. We've covered VAV systems separately, again, links down below for that. Then we have the ductwork, which sends the air around the building to the designated areas. We'll also have some ductwork coming back, which is bringing all the used air from the building back to a separate part of the AHU. This return AHU is usually located near the supply, but it doesn't have to be, it can be located elsewhere in the building. The return AHU in its simplest form has just a fan and a damper inside. The fan is pulling air in from around the building and then pushing it all the way out of the building into the atmosphere. The damper is located at the exit of the AHU housing and will close when the AHU turns off. That's a very simple and typical AHU, so what else might we find? If you're in a cold part of the world where air temperatures reach freezing point or close to it, then we'll find a preheater in the inlet of the fresh air intake. This is usually an electrical heater. When the outside air gets around 6 degrees Celsius or 42.8 degrees Fahrenheit, the heater will turn on and heat up the air to protect the components inside from frost. Otherwise, this could freeze the heating and cooling coils inside and burst them. What about humidity control? Some buildings need to control the humidity of the air they supply into the building. We'll find a humidity sensor at the outlet of the supply AHU to measure the moisture in the air supply. This will also have a set point for how much moisture should be in the air by design. If the air's moisture content is below this value, then we need to introduce moisture into the air using a humidifier. This is usually one of the last things in the AHU. This device will usually either add steam or a spray of water mist into the air. Many standard office type buildings in Northern Europe and Northern America have turned off their humidity units or uninstalled them to save energy. Although they are still crucial for places like document stores and computer rooms. If the air is too humid, then this can be reduced through the cooling coil. As the air hits the cooling coil, the cold surface will cause the moisture within the air to condense and flow away you'll find a drain pan under the cooling coil to catch the water and drain this away. The cooling coil can be used to further reduce the moisture content by removing more heat, but of course this will decrease the air temperature below the supply set point. If this occurs, then the heating coil can be turned on to bring the temperature back up. This will work, although it is very energy intensive. Energy recovery. If the supply and extract AHUs are located in different areas, then a common way to recover some of the thermal energy is to use a runaround coil. This uses a coil in both AHUs and a pump circulates water between the two. This will pick up waste heat from the extract AHU and add this to the supply AHU. This will reduce the heating demand on the heating coil when the outside air temperature is below the supply set point temperature and the return air temperature is higher than the set point. The heat would otherwise be wasted as it is simply rejected to atmosphere. As the pump will consume electricity, it is only cost effective to turn on if the energy saved is more than the pump will consume. Another very common version we'll come across is to have a duct sit between the exhaust and the fresh air intake. This allows some of the exhaust air to be recirculated back into the fresh air intake to offset the heating and cooling demand. An additional damper sits within the connecting duct to control how much air can be recirculated. This is safe and healthy to do so, but you will need to ensure that the exhaust air has a low CO2 count, so we need some CO2 sensors to monitor that. If the CO2 level is too high, then the air can't be reused. The mixing damper will close and all the return air will be rejected from the building. 
When in recirculation mode, the main inlet and outlet dampers will not fully close in this setup because we will still need a minimum amount of fresh air to enter the building. We can use this in the winter if the return air is warmer than the outside air, and we can also use this in the summer if the return air is cooler than the outside air, respected to the supply set point temperature. We'll also need some temperature sensors at the intake, return, and just after the mixing region. Some buildings require 100% fresh air, so this strategy can't be used everywhere. The local laws and regulations will dictate this. Another variation we might come across is the heat wheel. This is very common in newer compact AHUs. This uses a large rotating wheel. Half of it sits within the exhaust airstream and half of it sits within the fresh air intake. The wheel will rotate, driven by a small induction motor. As it rotates, it picks up unwanted heat from the exhaust stream and absorbs this into the wheel's material. The wheel then rotates into the fresh air intake stream. This air is at a lower temperature than the exhaust stream, so the heat will transfer from the wheel and into the fresh air stream, which obviously heats the incoming airstream up and thus reduces the demand on the heating coil. This is very effective, but some air will leak from the exhaust into the fresh air stream, so this cannot be used in all buildings. Another version we might come across is the air plate heat exchanger. This uses thin sheets of metal to separate the two streams of air so that they do not come into direct contact or mix at all. The temperature difference between the two air streams will cause a heat to transfer over from the hot exhaust stream through the metal walls of the heat exchanger and into the cold intake stream. The two air streams need to cross over for this to occur, so it can be a little confusing to look at. Just remember the air streams are not mixed. We come back to the all air central air conditioning system and then we will look at further variations of this type of system which are the constant air volume or the constant volume system or the variable air volume system. The constant volume system means that the volume of air that is conditioned air supplied to a conditioned space remains unchanged even if the load in the space changes. That means the variation in the load will be countered by changing the temperature of the air keeping the volume supplied to the conditioned space unchanged. So the simplest of these is the single duct constant volume single zone system. It has one supply duct through which the hot or cold air will flow. According to our requirement in winter we will be using the heating coil we will provide hot air to the conditioned space. In summer we will be supplying cold air to the conditioned space. And uh, the schematic diagram is shown to you over here. So you can see that we have the cooling coil, the heating coil. You might also have a humidifier over here or it's shown over here in this uh, schematic diagram. And we have the supply duct, then you have the return duct. Part of the return air is exhausted. The recirculated air is mixed with outside air. Then it is passed through the cooling or heating coil as required. The uh, on the psychrometric chart, the cooling cycle that we had looked at earlier will apply to this particular arrangement. It has certain arrangement uh, advantages and disadvantages which are listed over here because it's the simplest of the designs. It has a low first cost and maintenance is easy. But again, the restriction is uh, that it can condition only one zone. It is not suitable for multiple zones. And if there is a change in the requirement of a building from a single zone system to a multiple zone system, uh, th this uh, type of a system, if, if it, we have in installed it, would not be easily modified. It will be probably e uh, better to shift to a proper multi-zone system, which we are going to look at as we move through this discussion. So now let's look, uh, look at that possibility that we still have a single duct and a constant volume system but this time it is a system which will serve multiple zones. And uh, for simplicity in the schematic diagram I have shown two zones they can be more than two zones and this type of arrangement is known as a terminal reheat system. 
in which we can see that there e before each of the zone there is what is known as a reheat coil and the purpose of the reheat coil is to provide energy to the air which comes from the cooling coil according to the zone requirement okay. now let's say at state 6 after the cooling coil we have the air coming in at 12 degree C and we need to supply the air to zone A which we are keeping at let's say 24 degree C whereas zone B is going to be maintained at uh, a lower temperature or uh, we will uh, maintain it at a high temperature you will see the reason why I've, I'm saying that let's say we are going to maintain it at 26 degree C so that means the air that we are supplying over here let's say we need to supply it at a temperature of 18 degree C that I will also mention over here and the supply temperature to zone B let's say that is higher that will twenty degree C so the supply of air at state 1A is at 18 degree C and the space is going to be maintained at 24 degree C the supply of air at state 1B to zone B is at 20 degree C and zone B is maintained at 26 degree C what we have done we have cooled the air to 12 degree C now this reheat coil will heat up the air from 12 degree C to 18 degree C and similarly it will heat up the air that comes at 12 degree C to 20 degree C for zone B so that by this use of reheat coils we are able to meet the requirements of multiple zones for example again if we want to look at what happens if the load in zone A increases if the load in zone A increases it means that this temperature will begin to rise and what we will want is if we want to keep it at 24 degree C the supply A temperature will have to be reduced from 18 degree C to let's say 15 degree C so that means the amount of heating that we were providing in the reheat coil will be reduced and then again we will be supplying air at a lower temperature to counteract the increase in the load on the other hand if the load decreases this temperature will start to drop that means we will have to supply the air at a higher temperature so we will add reheat in the coil and then again we will balance the load variation in the zone the same is now shown on the psychrometric chart okay. I will just uh, reduce it a little so we can look at it the schematic as well as the psychrometric diagram which shows the cooling cycle for a terminal reheat system with two zones you can see this 671 state 671 they are all the same so they are shown over here that is after the cooling coil then state 1a and state 1b they are going to be different and I've shown that temperature at 1a was less 18 degree C 
and that's why we, by looking at it I had said that the temperature at state 1b will be higher so you can see the dry bulb temperature at 1a is lower than the dry bulb temperature at 1b and because the reheat coil only sensibly heats the air so the process is shown over here there is sensible heating from state 6 to state 1a and there is sensible heating from state 6 to state 1b for each of the two zones then from state 1a the air goes into zone a and from here it goes into zone b so these two lines over here this line over here for example is the space condition line or the load ratio line for zone a similarly this line over here is the space condition line for zone b and you can see due to the load there is a increase in the dry bulb temperature and humidity ratio that means there is both a sensible and latent load similarly for zone b then the air that is returned from zone a and zone b the two streams are combined together and the resultant state will be 2 so we have adiabatic mix mixing of states 2a and 2, uh, 2b to give us the resultant state 2 and that means state 2 will lie on the straight line connecting zone uh, states 2a and 2b so you can see state 2 over here the air that is exhausted we are labeled it as 3 but the state 2 and 3 is the same because the exhausted air is the same as the uh, returned air in terms of the state then the returned air the recirculated air is mixed with the outside air so the outside air is at state 4 you can see state 4 higher temperature higher humidity ratio outside air at state 4 mixes with the recirculated air at state 2 or state 3 you can say they are the same to give us the mixed condition at state 5 then that air which is at state 5 is cooled and dehumidified this is the cooling and dehumidification process and when we get back to state 6 that is how this cyclometric diagram shows the cooling cycle of a terminal reheat system and if you are given a problem you can solve it in the usual manner that is our objective will be to first locate as many state points as possible so that we complete the cycle and once we have done that we can extract any further information that is required then the advantages and disadvantages of the this type of a system the terminal reheat system are, uh, is also given to you uh, relatively sp small less space is required temperature and con humidity control is very very good and it is flexible and reheal reheat can be added or removed according to the change in the load in the zone but the prime disadvantage is the energy cost it is expensive to operate so it's energy inefficient and for this particular reason especially these days when there is a great emphasis on energy conservation the use of these systems are quite strictly regulated by most energy codes and standards all across the globe we will now move on to the second type of a multiple zone system with a, again a constant air volume and that is known as the dual duct constant volume multiple zone system and the name dual duct comes from the fact that instead of a single duct supplying air to the condition zone we have two ducts one will carry cold air and the other warm air from the air handling unit to the conditioned space and how this works once we look at the schematic diagram you will be able to understand that first look at the schematic diagram you can see because we have two ducts one will have cold air so there's a cooling coil for that the other will have a heating coil for uh, generating warm, warm air and it might also have a humidifier if the humidifier is not there we can again uh, still have a heater and that will still be a dual duct system 
So if you look at state six, the air that we have at state six is divided into two streams. One goes over to the cooling coil, the other goes to the heating coil. And we have the two zones again over here shown and I will again put in some numbers over here to s say let's say the temperature is so much over here and I want a different temperature over here and I'll just quickly take a look at the diagram over here to see zone 1b 1a 2a and 2b 2b is higher so we will say that this is again 26 degrees C I think we can, we can leave it like this and again we will be supplying air to zone A at a lower temperature and to zone B at a higher temperature. If this is 24, 17 degrees C and we will supply air to zone B at a higher temperature twenty one degree C the air coming from the cooling oil again I need to just give some numbers we have 14 degrees C over here and the air that is heated and humidified has a higher temperature 40 degrees C what we want to do is now provide air to zone A at 17 and zone B at 21 degrees C respectively what we will do is that the air that we are supplying from the cooling coil will be mixed by the with the air coming from the heating coil in a mixing box and by changing the proportion of the air in this mixing box we can control the supply temperature to a particular zone the same applies to zone B for example again if the load in zone A increases it means this temperature will start to increase and we will have to reduce the temperature to zone A and that can be done by reducing the amount of warm air and increasing the amount of cold air such that the volume flow rate into the zone does not change but the proportions of cold and hot airs hot air can be varied and that way we can vary the temperature of the supply air to the zone according to the zone load requirements and the same, same will apply to zone B again I will show you the schematic diagram and the uh, cooling cycle on the psychrometric chart and we will again start with 
the cooling coil position that is 7 and we will look at the coil position uh, 9 which is for the heating coil you can see that in the mixing box the two streams are adiabatically mixed so the resultant state will lie on a straight line connecting states 7 and 9 so you can see state 9 and state 7 the resultant state for zone A is 1A and the resultant state for zone B is 1B and both these states are obtained by the adiabatic, adiabatic mixing of states 7 and 9 so those must lie on the straight line connecting 7 and 9 so you can see 1B and 1A and 1B one B oh sorry one A and one B uh, I think I need to according to this diagram over here one A is higher and one B is lower lower so I this temperature over here if it is 24 maybe this will be you can say this is going to be 22 you can change that value let me change this value so that it is in line with the psychrometric diagram and this will then be let's say call it 15 degree C or let's say 16 degree C okay now if you look at these two values over here they are consistent with the diagram that is drawn over here temperature 1a is higher than temperature 1b so temperature 1a is higher than temperature 1b though it could be the other way around so you can have state 1b B at a higher temperature and state 1a at a lower temperature that depends on the zone uh, conditions then again you have the load ratio lines 1b to 2b and then 1A to 2A so that's the space condition line for the two zones then the return air from both the zones is mixed to give you the resultant state 2 that we can see over here that resultant state 2 is mixed with the outside air to give us state 5 so 2 and 4 gives us state 5 and state 6 is the same which is after passing through the fan now we have the division of the air into two streams one is cooled and dehumidified the other is heated and humidified and those two streams are shown by the respective processes this is first sensible heating from state 6 to state 8 when it passes over the heating coil then it is humidified and the other stream it is it is cooled and dehumidified to state 7 so heating and humidification to state 9 cooling and humidification to state 7 then these mixing of the two streams in the mixing box which is where we started from so that is the cooling cycle for a dual duct constant air volume multiple zone system we will look at the advantages and disadvantages and move on to the th another arrangement for conditioning the multiple zones this is a uh, type of arrangement it has advantage that it can provide simultaneous heating and cooling in different zones so if you need heating in one zone and cooling in one another zone at the same time because because we can vary the proportion of the air of the air in the mixing box we can do that and again it uh, responds very well to variations in zone load and maintains precise conditions in the conditioned space indoor air quality is also maintained properly and no seasonal changeover is necessary that if you want to shift from winter to uh, summer air conditioning the same system can be seamlessly uh, used for that disadvantages of course because there are two ducts the, it, it, we need uh, more space and each duct has to be sized to handle the entire flow rate if required for example if 
only cold air is required so we it should be able to handle the maximum flow rate that duct the cold air duct and similarly the hot air duct and it has a high initial cost and again energy usage is a problem because we are heating and cooling the, the air at the same time it's not very energy efficient we now move on to the other arrangement that you will see is the one that we used in modern air conditioning systems which is known as the variable air volume system and it is suitable for multiple zones in a variable air volume system as the name implies the quantity of air that is supplied to the zone can be varied whereas the temperature is kept constant previously we were keeping the quantity of air constant and varying the temperature it is the other way around in the case of a vav system and to ensure that the volume flow rate to the zone can be varied we need a unit that is known as a vav unit or a variable air volume unit or a vav box which will allow us to vary the volume flow rate to the zone and yet again we have the schematic diagram over here and at the same time i will try to show you the cooling cycle drawn on the psychrometric diagram you can see after the cooling coil we have state 7 and the air goes at state 7 into both the zones so we have air going into both the zones at the same state it's only the volume flow rate is different but uh, uh, again because the zone loads are different sensible and latent loads can be different the space condition lines for the two zones will have different slopes that you can see from state 1 from 1a to 2a for zone a and 1b to 2b then the return air is combined from the two zones to give us state 2 that return air part of it is exhausted and then it is mixed with the outside air which is at state 4 to give us state 5 and state 6 is the same after passing through the fan and then it passes over the coil it is cooled and dehumidified so it's similar to the cycle for uh, the the basic cooling cycle that we had looked at but the difference this time of course is that we are handling two zones and so this portion will show that difference over here and we can move on to the advantages and disadvantages of this type of a system you can see that uh, the principal advantages it's lower energy uh, con uh, consumption uh, even during partial load conditions and that also leads to lower fan power consumption so the our system savings uh, when we use a variable a variable air volume system and that is why modern air conditioning plants extensively use this sort of a system temperature controls in the both the interior and ex external zones can be carried out very well and we can also shift the air flows from one zone to another according to any change in the requirements disadvantages we have a high initial cost but because it's very energy efficient that high energy cost uh, initial cost uh, pays back in a short duration because we are reducing the air flow rate in the conditioned space if the load changes it might also cause a uh, uh, deterioration of the indoor air quality at very low loads because the air flow rates will have to be reduced that means the amount of outside air or the fresh air that proportion will reduce and the air quality inside might not be maintained so that could be a consideration that we have to keep uh you uh, know in, in mind so the same is uh, that when we have uh, low loads because the volume flow rates is is of air is low the distribution of the air in the conditioned space may not also be uh, uh, carried out in the manner that it is uh, desired to be and humidity control under varying widely varying lo latent loads is difficult although not 
impossible but it becomes difficult if the variation is too large i will now show you an actual vav box and how it is connected to the supply duct so if you look at this this is the supply duct over here and in this supply duct at the end before the zone you can see the vav box and this is a close up look of the vav box this is where the it will be connected to the supply duct so there's a air flow sensor over here that and there will be a damper inside so this is the actuator to open or close the da uh, the damper there is a this is the control system over here and we are going to look at a labeled schematic of the same so you have the velocity sen sensor you will have a flow damper which can open and close to increase or decrease the volume flow rate going into the conditioned space and this box is primarily to reduce the noise as the air passes through this damper we have the control system over here along with the actuator and if required some of these vav boxes also have a reheat option so you can provide a reheat option although it is not necessary sometimes you can do that but it does not provide too much of a reheat it has limited capacity for reheat this is how we can vary the volume flow rate through into the conditioned zone so i have placed a question at the end this is for a terminal reheat system and it is left as an exercise for you to solve this question and as i mentioned earlier the procedure will be of course similar to that of a cooling cycle that we had gone through earlier that we need to locate the states and develop the entire cooling cycle and once we have that we can then uh, extract the desired answers as we proceed with the solution of the problem and that is all for this lecture and we will continue in with a new topic in the next lecture